Namaskar students, we are moving on to lecture 25, that is the theories of IR. We are again, it is International Society School, which we started in the last lecture, and this is the part two of it. It is very important that we understand the school, because the school has a very original and a different uh, idea, which places human beings, human rights, and states people at the center of international relation standards. It says that yes, we have a system of states, but at the same time, the society of states is as important, or what they call the international society. They say that human beings have been cages with each other, and there are certain inalienable rights as human beings, certain values, certain norms that all states have to observe when it has to deal with human beings. Now, as we started, we touched upon the two major thinkers of this school, and that is Martin White and Hedley Bull. Both, very unfortunately, died very young. And all, all, all of most of you know that this was set up as a committee for international politics in uh, Great Britain in 1958. And it was closed off after the death of Hedley Bull. Both Hedley Bull and Martin White died in their 50s, which is very unfortunate, some of the greatest few original thinkers. And as students of international relations, their school, their ideas have formed into, as I told you, a different uh, school in the 90s. And it was very important because with the rise in the post-Cold War world, of the concept of human security, human development, humanitarian intervention, these ideas were seen as unique and different. Now, foundational ideas of international relations from this school is the never-ending synergy between realists, rationalists, and revolutionists. In the last lecture, I told you what they stood for. Realists are those who emphasize and concentrate on the absolute aspect of international anarchy, structure. Rationalists who emphasize and concentrate on the aspect of international dialogue and intercourse, cooperation, they bring in. Third are the revolutionists who believe that there is a moral unity of all humankind. They represent different basic outlooks on world politics that compete with each other. Now, Wright's three IR traditions. We did Martin Wright's conflict. First, realism, what does it have? Anarchy, power politics, conflict and warfare, and pessimism. Rationalism, the second school that he identifies, is with society evolutionary change, peaceful coexistence, and hope without illusions. The third school, revolutionism, is centers upon humanity, revolutionary change, calls for a global community, and it is a hopefulness. The main ideas that both White and Bull bring about to international relations are order and justice. Both White and Bull saw theory as IR theory, as a, what to say, a statist of political theory under the influence of history. They believed it was possible to theorize international relations within the context of concrete historical events and episodes. Anarchical society, according to Bull, is the promotion and preservation of international order, which is defined as a pattern or disposition of international activity that sustains those goals of a society of states that are elementary, primary, or universal. Now, Hedley Bulls, there has four goals. What are they? First, the preservation of the international system. Second, upholding the independence of member states, maintaining peace, helping to secure the normative foundations of all social life. 
which includes the limitation of violence. It's very important because see, human trafficking, everything is structural violence and they believe that there has to be a limitation. Three, the keeping of promises expressed in the principle of reciprocity. Four, the stability of possession expressed in the principle of mutual recognition of state sovereignty. So if you see both his goals, the first two goals are about human beings, are about the society. And then only they, he moves to the principle of state sovereignty, of state safety. Bulls three kinds of orders. What are the three orders that he says are important? First, order in social life, which is an essential element of international relations, regardless of the form it takes. Second, international order, which is the order between states in the system or society of states. Third, world order, which order among humankind as a whole. World order is more fundamental and primordial than international order because the ultimate units of the great society of all humankind are not states but individual human beings. So here is the crux to all, all our debates in the post-Cold War world. That is why in the 90s when this debate came about about human security, human development, humanitarian intervention, these, this school, many people realized, was very distinct from the realist or the liberal traditions of international politics. And that is why it was placed as a separate school in international relations. States and the society of states are merely temporary, that is, historical arrangements of human relations. But individual human beings are permanent and in, that's indestructible. This is the solidarist, but most of his theory is pluralist. Normative. If you see their great stress on values and ethics in international relations, and they think this is very important because the basic unit of international relations has to be human beings, their security, their uh, progress, their development. The primary responsibility of sustaining international order between states belongs to the great powers achieved by managing their relations with one another. Hedley Bull wants that great powers like small powers frequently behave in such a way as to promote disorder rather than order. Two major occasions in the 20th century, that is World War I and World War II, that shook the foundations of world politics. The objective balance of power is a factual reality, but the subjective balance is a matter of belief and even faith. The doctrine and hope of promoting and maintaining a balance of power to achieve and maintain the value of international order. Bull uses historical and contemporary illustrations on the nature of war. Wars between great powers are non-existent. Proxy wars, Korea, Vietnam. These wars are of a third kind, which include revolutionary wars of national liberation, civil wars, and secessionist wars. War. War is organized violence carried by political units against each other. This is Clausewitz. It seems then that Hedley Bull begins where the other theorists had begun, and thus he holds the common view that war is a political phenomenon. He goes on to say that war can only occur between political units. His emphasis on justice and morality mirrors that of white. And it seems that he also favors a more Grotian or a solidarist view of international politics, as well as the notion of a common good. The idea of a society of states leads him to conclude that war should be regulated by norms or rules, whether legal or otherwise. 
Grotius calls this law of nations, war should be carried on only within the bounds of law and good faith. Now, order and justice are the two concepts that Hedley Bull works out here. Order for him is first order in social life. We have already done this. International order and world order. Justice, in the same way human justice, interstate justice and world justice. Justice for Hedley Bull. Various conceptions of justice, particular attention between commutative justice and distributive justice. What is commutative justice? It is about procedures and reciprocity. It also involves a process of claim and counterclaim among states, a level playing ground. All states play by the same rules of international society. Justice is fairness of the rules of the game. The same rules are applied in the same way to everybody. The rules of the game are expressed by international law and diplomatic practices. This is the principal form of international justice. Distributive justice is about goods. It involves the issues of how goods should be distributed between states, as exemplified by the idea that justice requires a transfer of economic resources from the rich countries to the poor. This has something to do very much with what we are talking about in human security. So this idea of justice that Hedley Bull is trying to tell us is about both commutative justice, that it has to be fair. It has to be a level playing ground. And number two, about distributive justice, meaning that people should have equal opportunities and those who are poor should bend, there should be a transfer of these resources from the rich to the poor. Three levels of justice in world politics. He goes on to tell us then there are three levels. What are the three levels? International or interstate justice, which is basically the notion of equal state sovereignty. Individual or human justice, which basically involves ideas of human rights and humanitarian justice and humanitarian law. World justice, which basically involves what is right or good for the world as a whole. For example, in global environmental standards or in uh, what to say on uh, many issues of human security, global health standards. Order is seen to be more fundamental or even gender rights. It is a condition for the realization of other values. Order is prior to justice because without order, justice becomes more difficult to achieve. World society. World society exists in parallel with international society. International society is pluralist and rests on sovereign states World society, by contrast, is solidaris and rests on the community of humankind and the cosmopolitan culture of late modernity. As defender of humankind and protector of human rights, sovereign states have an increasingly important place in acknowledging and upholding world society. So every state is expected to protect the human rights of its citizens, failing to which the global community can intervene. World society is seen to be manifested in various international organizations with a humanitarian purpose, particularly the protection of human rights. Individuals accused of having committed acts of genocide or other flagrant human rights violations have brought before those tribunals. Some of them have been found guilty and have been punished in accordance with international law. For example, the Nuremberg trial. World society, since the end of the Cold War, a permanent tribunal, the International Criminal Court has been established, whose enacting Rome statute has been endorsed by a large number of sovereign states, although by no means all of them. 
three permanent members of the United Nations Security Council have refused to become parties to their own statute, the USA, Russia, and China. There is no doubt that world society has become an increasingly significant feature of international relations since the end of the Cold War. The human rights regimes of contemporary world society have not come into existence in the independently from the society of states. International society based on state sovereignty is not inconsistent with a world society of human societies. Solidarism, two versions. State-centric solidarists see states as the main producer of human rights in the international world. Cosmopolitan solidarists see human rights as standing above states. Pluralist criticism is normally addressed at cosmopolitan solidarism and the bogeyman that threatens international order that it often ignores the same centric position with solidarism. Statecraft and responsibility. The study of normative choices in foreign policy with which responsible states people are confronted. Please understand, this is where your Canadian school of human security comes in. Because it believes it has this, these three levels of responsibility. One, devotion of one's own nation and the well-being of its citizens. Two, respect for the legitimate interests and rights of other states and international law. And three, respect for human rights. Now there are four forms of responsibility. Responsible to whom and responsible for what? National are citizens, national security. International, other states, international order, peace and security. States people are responsible for the well-being of their citizens. What is the national responsibility? National security is the foundational value they are duty-bound to protect. Always put your nation and its citizens first. That's what most of your leaders tell us. Be Indian, buy Indian, Atma Nirbhar Bharat, or even the United States of America, make in America. America first. Always put your nation and its citizens first. Avoid taking unnecessary risks with their security and welfare. Collaborate with other countries when it is the advantages or necessary. But avoid needless foreign entanglements and do not subject your population to war unless it is absolutely necessary. States are seen to have no international obligations that come before their national interests. International law and international organizations are merely instrumental considerations in determining the national interests of states. States are good international citizens because it is their national interest. International responsibility. It involves rights and duties as defined by international law. Grotian precepts recognize that other states have international rights and legitimate interests which deserve respect. Act in good faith, observe international law and comply with the laws of war. Pluralist society of states based on international relations, namely rationalism. International obligation, states are not isolated or autonomous political entities, responsible only for, to their own people. States have foreign obligations to other states and to international society as a whole form, which they reciprocally and jointly obtain important rights and benefits. The third is humanitarian responsibility. It is here that this school makes a very important contribution to the present debate on human security, human development, humanitarian intervention, and to human rights. 
States people are first and foremost human beings, and as such, they have a fundamental obligation to respect human rights, not only in their country, but also in all countries around the world. To your world society, international society, I get that. Kantian precepts, always remember that people in other countries are human beings just like yourself. Respect human rights. Give sanctuary to those who are fleeing persecution. Assist those who are in need of material aid, which can supply at no sacrifice to yourself and in waging war, spare the non-combatants. That is, don't hit on civilian populations. That is why terrorism is taught us to be cowardice. Because whom day they, they hit civilians and non-combatants. That is why it is immoralistic. It is a war. They, they, uh, they don't follow any morals, have no values. And they, if they are invoking a religion for it, then the people of that religion should condemn it. Theory of human obligation. Before one can be a citizen of a state and a member of its government, one must be a human being. Pain your human security, your human rights, and all these human development. Today, these standards have brought in what is called positive international law that states have agreed to honor. Humanitarian responsibility and war. The absence in the UN Charter of articles that explicitly authorize the use of armed force to protect human rights, other humanitarian purposes has been seen by many countries and by humanitarian NGOs, that is non-governmental organizations, as a deficiency to be corrected. The justification of war has come to be known as the responsibility to protect doctrine. Proponents of the doctrine have accordingly sought to justify the international use of armed force beyond self-defense and international peace and security by adding military intervention for human protection purposes. It could be triggered by large-scale loss of life actual or apprehended, produced by deliberate state action, or state neglect for inability to act or a failed state situation. It would also be triggered by large-scale ethnic cleansing, actual or apprehended, like in Rwanda, Burundi, or even in Kosovo, states where such human catastrophes occurred could no longer hide behind their sovereignty. For example, genocide ethnic cleansing in 1971 by Pakistan and General Chikha Khan in Bangladesh or between the Tamils and the Sinhalese in Sri Lanka where the Tamils have alleged a genocide and ethnic cleansing. R2P meaning right to protect key concepts. State sovereignty implies responsibility for the protection of its people lies with the state itself. This comes under your freedom from fear. Where a population is suffering serious harm, it also brings in freedom from want. Look at Sudan, Somalia, Rwanda, all these failed states. Where a population is suffering serious harm as a result of internal war, insurgency, Repression, a state failure, and the state in question is unwilling or unable to halt or avert it. The principle of non-intervention yields to the international responsibility to protect. Criticism of R2P, meaning right to protect. 2011 intervention to Libya by NATO air forces to the country protect the country's civilian population from banned uh, attacks of the violent regime of Muammar Gaddafi. The intervention was authorized by the UN SC resolution of 1973. Subsequently, Libya deteriorated into a condition of armed anarchy and warfare that is characteristic of a failed state. Russia and China complained that NATO had overstepped the mandate given by the UN Security Council resolution 
1973 by offensive bombing designed to trigger a regime change in Libya. Remains very controversial, both the Gulf War, everything is it. Even India's intervention into Bangladesh is seen under this right to protect because at that time in 1971, the argument made was it was cheaper to fight a war then look after the huge number of refugees who had come to India because of the genocide committed by the Pakistan army on Bengalis. Uh, it remains very controversial and many states continue to reject it, yet the humanitarian concerns which it reflects are beyond question. History and the international society approach. It is this approach that has brought in these questions into international relations theory and it is a very important contribution. The expansion story. Understanding how to present international society came into being via the expansionist uh, European system. Central to Hedley Bull's work is the anarchical society. Two-fold investigation of the origins and development of European state system which by the 19th century had developed into a truly international society. One, much of the emphasis here lies on the emergence of the balance of power as an institution promoted and sustained by the great powers, the concert of Europe, 1815 to 1915. Cultural barriers kept the Ottomans apart. Even now in the what to say, European Union, this is a question when it comes to Turkey. And now under Erdogan, Turkey has really showed that it is a totally different cultural. And recently with the statement that he made on President Macron is very unfortunate. That means Italy does not, that means Turkey does not accept international universal values. And the whole idea of secular democratic nationalism of right to dissent. The evolution story, understanding similarities and differences between historical state systems and international societies. The research agenda of the British Committee, White and Watson, the evolution of international society. Watson compares state systems from the Sumerians to the present. He launches a theory which illustrates with, the, with this, his metaphor, of time's pendulum swinging from empire to one end to independence at the other. Empire may be defined as a hierarchical system between an imperial government and its various dependencies in which sovereignty is ex held exclusively by that government and is exercised as supremacy or dom dominion over its dependencies. Independence in the anarchical world of neorealism, where each state determines its own domestic and foreign policy. Both extremes are unstable. Historically, a pull towards the center where the pendulum rests, which he calls hegemony. The three traditions, traditional critiques of the international uh, society school. Realism, Weak evidence of norms, interests dominate. Liberalism says, ignores domestic society, ignores democracy, ignores progress. The international political economy, there's the radicals and the Marxists say it econom ignores economics, ignores develop the developing world. The three solidarist critics, who first comes from transnational society, Transnational society theorists tell us that state and non-state differentiation has to be made. Second, what about transnational activities? Now religion has become a major transnational activity with the, because of internet and communication technology. International civil society, does it exist? Is it fragmented? Public and private coexistence. Global society. Theorists say it is anti-statist. Complex global relations. He doesn't talk about that. And world society. Global injustice group says it's anti-statist. Global protection racket. 
there are human wrongs and world injustice criticisms there is the realist critique that evidence of international normative determinants of state policies are is weak or non existent the liberal critique says that it downplays domestic politics democracy and cannot account for the progressive change in international relations the radical marxist iep or international political economy critic is it fails to give an account of international economic relations several of solidarist critics focus on limitations perhaps its failure as theory to come to grips with an emerging post modern world so with this we finish the international society school a school that is different and a school that gave ideas that today many of us are trying to grapple with for example human security human development humanitarian intervention and human rights in this whole solidarist school thank you students we'll see you for the next lecture thank you